Tim, welcome to Watchbox Reviews and the only show we film right here at Watches Live. There's only one live show on this channel, so you're in the right place. Welcome to my friends from far flung, those who are joining from around the world. Let me know how the stream health is doing because connectivity has been an issue tonight. Let's jump straight into the program for the evening. There is a link in the description and I'm giving you a watch for November. The giveaway watch is going to be the legendary Tudor Black Rose, the 79220N. Short production span modern tutor equals excellent collectible timepiece a collectible tutor you can actually wear in the water and i'm giving it to you but you've got to enter link in the description friends from around the world eddie landsberg first patrick s second tom p russell 996 joe d nolan reed abraham g dr t from wales and i am charlie mouse from london so we have xavier joining from manila julio b patrick s from melbourne dr t says the stream is good barry b howdy right back at you and noah from my man my neck of the woods in new york city toad alley welcome from valencia spain let's jump straight into the good stuff first happy birthday to my mother she's celebrating her birthday today i had a wonderful weekend home with the family my mom's been the most important person in my life everything i'm doing here everything i've achieved i owe to her so thank you mom and we'll lead off with the best of the night in honor of mom this was the coolest simple watch of basel world 2018 glasuta original vintage 60s degrade dial three hands four numerals, 39 millimeters in stainless steel. This is anything but an entry-level dial. It's stamped with a 60-ton press at Glasuta Original's Forsheim dial manufacturer. It's then lacquered from the center out. Starting with a light green metallic, it fades to black, and since these are executed by hand, no two are exactly alike. Inspired by the spirit of the swing in 60s, you can see a 60s font as well as, and you're going to have to look at it off-axis a little bit, recession or revetment num uh, indices. So these indices are actually dug into the dial rather than applique or printings on top of the dial. They are little wells in the dial base itself. A beautiful watch, slim at under 10 millimeters with a bubble-like profile. This timepiece may be designed to evoke 1960s timepieces, but a German-made machine with bubbles like this actually reminds me of another signature from the Teutonic world in that era. The bubble cars made by Heinkel and Messerschmitt and the BMW Izetta. If you can remember those, you might see a little bit of resemblance in the profile of this watch. My absolute favorite, I lead with my biggest gun. Happy birthday, Mom. That watch is for you. Jumping straight into something else from a German-speaking region of a very different persuasion from the Saxonia family, the Saxomat. The Longomatic. This is the Longomatic 308025, a timepiece 38 millimeters, it's actually about 37.5 with a grand date, and you have the grand date pusher, fully loomed alpha hands at center, and a opaline style grained dial with white gold applique. In platinum, this timepiece features the standout L092 Saxomat caliber. Now, this is both a gold winding mass and a platinum rotor. You get both and they're joined with blued screws. Automatic winding, 21.6 beat rate, 46 hour power reserve. The decoration on this movement runneth over. Perlage, anglage, engraving of the rotor itself as well as freehand engraving of the half bridge for the balance and a black polished swan's neck regulator. Perlage on the base plate, glasuta stripes across the bridges because we are not in Switzerland. They will not be Cote de Genève and both blued and black polished screws. You almost regret having to wear the watch with the dial facing up. But this is a deep well of gratification from a Longo Unzona and proof that you can get that in a three-hand watch with a date. It feels like a grand complication. Jumping straight in, Dr. T saying the Geo is just as striking as the Journe Chronomet Bleu. And Eddie Landsberg, how would you compare the color fade of that Geo to a Moser? The Moser is... I'm going to even say a little bit less engaging. It, the Moser is more of a gradual fade, whereas the Geo is light, 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 and then it dramatically darkens at the edge, giving you maximum benefit of the deep stamped imprint on that dial that looks like someone dropped a water balloon full, full of paint. It's spectacular. The Moser is impressive. The Geo is singular. It's the only thing I've seen that looks and feels that exciting. Now, we're going to stay in our German-speaking regions, but we're going to jump over to Switzerland. IWC of Schaffhausen. Since 1868, 
to repeat the phrase, a deep well of gratification for fans of Teutonically inclined timepieces. And in 1990, IWC released its modern masterpiece, and it is a Hall of Fame in one 42 millimeter platinum case. Now, this one was made in 1995, and it's one of 50 made in platinum that year. So they would make about 50 in each metal each year at IWC, and they made this model from 1990 to 2010 when it was redesigned as the Portuguese or Grand Complication. But the watch you see right here was designed by IWC design kingpin of the 80s, Hanno Bircher. The perpetual calendar was by Kurt Claus, fully programmed out to the year 2100 and fully coordinated all control through the crown. The basis of Valjoux 7750, one of the all-time great Swiss movements, and the min repeater movement, the, the module on top of the base, is actually designed by what was then Renault et Papi before Audemars Piguet bought the Concern. So we're going to set this one straight to 1259, or as close as I can get, we're going to sound off the IWC minute repeater in a sonorous platinum for you fans out there. Usain Bolt could probably run a 400 meter in the time it takes that thing to ring out, but what a way to take your time and hear your time. I had to remember to flip the watch onto the dial side toward the mic because the minute repeater on this watch is on the dial side. Let's jump into some independent horology. After a few brands owned by the corporate umbrella of Richemont and Swatch, let's talk about the little guy. Let's talk about De Bethune. Now, the company was founded in 2002 by David Zanetta and Denis Flageolet, but in 2003, they were already prepared to release an in-house caliber perpetual calendar. This is the De Bethune DB15 RT in rose gold. You can see the early De Bethune case shape, uh, evocative of the DB1 chronograph with the pointed, almost, cabochon style lugs. This was before the DB28, which would only come almost a decade later. Uh, this timepiece featuring the caliber 2004 inside twin mainspring barrels and four days of power reserve manually wound. You can see one of the earliest iterations of the De Bethune in-house balance. They've been through over half a dozen balance designs. You can see that this one featuring a non-annular profile. It's almost like two crossed battle axes with a titanium blued center cross member and then white gold outer masses. You'll also note this was before the triple pair chute as there was only shock protection on the center of the balance bridge. Gorgeous and wonderful early document of an effort by one of the landmark independents, one of the real defining independents and GPHG dominating brands of our time. I believe with the new investor and new ownership, we're going to begin to regard De Bethune along the same lines, and perhaps even in higher esteem than we regard F.P. Jorn. De Bethune is sworn to make about 150 to 200 watches a year going forward. Jorn's going to make about 600 to 900. I'm looking forward to that rivalry. I got to admit, I'm a De Bethune fanboy, and you can see they had it right from the very beginning. The shape would evolve, the movement would improve and become more sophisticated, but the basic ingredients were there right down to the spherical moon phase in blued steel and palladium. This thing is an early opus. De Bethune, exciting things to come. Now let's jump into two diving chronographs from different ends of the price point spectrum. On, well, I'm just going to say in my right hand, because I don't know how you're experiencing this on camera, you can see the Blancpain 50 Fathoms Chronograph Flyback Speed Command. This was a motorsports-inspired 45mm sapphire bezel carbon fiber dial 2009 timepiece designed to commemorate Blancpain's sponsorship of Lamborghini and its racing activities, as well as its involvement in the Blancpain GT series that started in that era. Now, whether you think this is necessarily the best use of the 50 Fathoms base, there's no doubting that this is one versatile watch. Automatic winding, 300 meter water resistant, highly loomed flyback chronograph with a date window. If you've got the panache to pull off black and yellow, you're one heck of a fellow. But for the rest of us who perhaps are looking for something a bit more, I don't know, I would say, run-of-the-mill for our daily 
driver, maybe even something that's designed to go into harm's way when you don't want to beat on your Rolex Daytona or your Blancpain Speed Command. This came out in 2013. It's the Hamilton Khaki Navy Sub Auto, Sub Chrono Auto. 43 millimeters in steel. You can actually see that it's a unique combination of an outer frame around a circular center. And you can you can just see that there are hollows of the case top through which you can see the top and the bottom of whatever happens to be behind the case. But what sets this watch apart, aside from the fact that its bezel action is superb, and you can hear the diet bezel on this one is excellent, is that this 2013 watch served as a debut platform for Hamilton's H31 caliber, a 60-hour automatic based on a Valjoux 7753, 300 meters water resistant with remarkably solid construction and a strap that is the equal of anything you'll see on an Hublot or AP at 10 to 20 times the price. This is a watch that sold new for just under $2,000, and it's a heck of a buy for a Swiss automatic caliber chronograph that you can also use for 300 meter diving, manta ray blazing on the back. This is a timepiece that you can own at an exceptionally low rate amounting to about one Roger Dubuis strap. And at that price point, it even gives you a high quirk factor. Look at the dial calibrated from one to zero. I love it. And the world needs more orange watches, as I've often said. I can see right here. Bum, 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 bum. And we have a comment, uh, Steve M. Hi from Guernsey in the English Channel. Wow, you're in the English Channel. Very cool. And I can see right here, Fjord Prefix saying, not without the tools. And Miguel Ray is asking, micro adjustment. No, not on that watch, but actually, let's keep our affordable chronograph theme going. We tend to talk about pre-1980 Tudor as a wonderful well of vintage value. And we tend to talk about the watches since the relaunch of the brand in 2010 as some of the best priced timepieces with the highest feature content going today. What we rarely talk about is Tudor during the 2000s. That seems to be a little bit of a gray area. The watches are not well known and they weren't perhaps as widely distributed as, as they could have been since Tudor exited North America back in 2003. Well, this is the 2007 to 2010 Tudor Sport Chrono and it is exactly what its name implies. There were 12 different dial variations for this watch. 41 millimeters with a cushion case, 150 meters water resistant. It's basically the all around sports chronograph that Rolex doesn't make because the Daytona does not have a date. And this watch features the most subtle screw down chronograph pushers you will ever encounter. I don't even know if I can illustrate this, but it's a one quarter turn pusher. You turn it up and now it's locked. You turn it down and now you can actuate the chronograph and it almost doesn't move, but it's an ingenious system that saves you the big bulky screw downs of a Daytona while giving you the same degree of water resistance. In fact, this is 100 meters. This is a white gold Rolex Daytona V-Series from 2009, 40 millimeters. This watch is from the same time period as it was made from 2007 to 2010. You give me a choice of the two, and obviously the Daytona has unrivaled heritage, and as a Rolex, it has name brand value. But in terms of panache, in terms of actual value, wearability, durability, and longevity, there's nothing to choose between these two watches. The Tudor, if anything, is less common, and in my opinion, just a bit more charming. Plus, the Tudor on a full bracelet with clasp gives you an element that the Daytona on a strap in white gold doesn't necessarily. I also love the fact that both of these watches from the same Rolex universe feature applique Arabic numeral dials. But if I had to make the choice, I'd go with the reference 2300. The Sport Chrono, not a piece we see often. Bump, 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 bump. Claudio, by the way, in the chat box tonight. Claudio is my friend from downstairs. He runs our boutique. He is our retail manager for all locations. He can answer any question you've got. And Claudio will have all of these watches in Tim's Corner all week this week at our Center City Walnut Street Philadelphia store. Come visit the watches. Come visit Claudio. Come visit me. We'll be waiting. Jumping back in, I can see right here, Rich Buddy saying, sorry, the Daytona looks way, way, way better. There's a reason the Daytona has endured since 60. And it's not because it doesn't look the business. Uh, it would be a hard choice for me. Let's jump into two from Grand Seiko, both of which are tributes to bump, 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 
the USA Patriotic Editions in celebration of the establishment of Grand Seiko USA, the first internationally established independent Grand Seiko subsidiary. Grand Seiko USA operates alongside Grand Seiko and Seiko in North America while being its own entity with marketing, retail locations, and personnel assigned. And these two watches, respectively, SBGA 384, 50 pieces in red gold, and SBGA 387, let me see if I can move them into the light a little better, are limited editions for the U.S. boutiques. Now, the steel watch is probably the more intriguing of the two. 558 pieces in stainless steel. Both of them are spring drive. The red gold watch we'll discuss first because it features a hot rodded spring drive. That gold medallion in the rotor lets you know this is an especially accurate spring drive movement, plus 0.5 seconds per day three-day power reserve and the dial of both watches featuring a Japanese painting style. It's not exactly the painting technique itself, but it's designed to emulate a Japanese painting style that loosely translates to shiny painting. And this is certainly that. You can see it has a sort of mottled metallic texture. It's a prismatic quality that reflects both different levels of luminescence as well as different colors and shades. You can see bronze, silver, violet, even blue and green if you look at it closely. 3A power reserve, spring drive automatic, and the case that we recognize established in 1967 with the 44 GS and ever since known as the polyhedron. These are appealing pieces and again only 50 pieces made in red gold, 558 pieces in stainless steel. I actually find the stainless steel priced at $6,800 new to be the more appealing of the two. First, it has wonderfully metallic blue almost galvanized look to the dial. It almost looks like galvanized metal. It is incredibly reactive and a totally different look from something like a sunburst metallic. I can't really compare it to anything. It's halfway between a Rolex tapestry dial and Grand Seiko's own snowflake while having its own entirely distinct character. And of course, both of them with display case backs, this particular model with a full bracelet, and they are beautifully executed. Same case form, polyhedron, black polish, the Zeratsu tin plate polishing technique executed on both, but in different metals. Now, one feature that I find quirky about the two, the rose gold case is 100 meters water resistant, no screw down. The steel case has a screw down, still 100 meters resistant. They are different cases. And I don't know if you guys can see this, but this was, in my opinion, the most curious accessory ever found on a Grand Seiko. The 18 karat red gold clasp is made in Italy. Probably the only part of the watch down to the lubricants that Grand Seiko did not make itself. So a few quirks on the red gold model and deploying clasps on Grand Seiko is very scarce. Let's jump into something that is wonderfully extravagant. In fact, let's jump into two. In my right hand, because, well, hang on, this is not gonna do. There's a wrap on the watch. That I can't sustain, that bothers me. Cellophane is for coal cuts, not for watches. Bump, 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 and okay, from Arnold and Son, because I know we have Arnold and Son fans in the audience, two of the great ones, the Torbion Truebeat. This is a timepiece with Arnold and Son 80 hour power reserve, manual wind, caliber 8100. You can look at the depth of that movement. You don't just look at that movement, you look through it, you look into it. It's like your own personal amphitheater of high horology on your wrist. This is a watch that makes the most of its size, opening up the dial and the caliber for the full enjoyment of the owner. And you can see that tourbillon beating away, everything revealed to the eye. Black polished tourbillon bridge, fully skeletonized, and the deadbeat red gold hand jumping around the dial in its one hertz beat. This is a watch with two heartbeats, one hertz and three hertz. Sensational stuff, but it gets better. Well, at least it gets more theatrical. With the DSTB released in 2014, Arnold and Son gives us a less expensive deadbeat second complication. Now, the first thing you'll note is that there is a sapphire chapter ring hovering above the deadbeat seconds display. And the deadbeat seconds operated by a Paul and Jewel system. So there's a Paul, there's a Jewel, and then there's a Paul wheel right underneath. And it moves in one beat jumps. You'll also note that the counterweight to the Paul lever is an Arnold and Son nautically themed anchor recalling the marine chronometer heritage of the namesake. Spectacular sunburst blue, but it's not a centered sunburst. You'll note that the graining radiates out from the dial, which is 
where four o'clock would conventionally be located on the dial. And you can see the depth of this mechanism from the side. It's just as dramatic as the tourbillon. Turn it all over and you'll note that the Arnold & Son Caliber 6003 is spectacularly hand finished with Cote de Soleil radiating out from center, but it's also a 45 hour automatic. 45 hour automatic with a rose lathe turned skeletonized rose gold rotor on a sunburst Cote de Genève center. This features, let me turn it all over, features heat blued screws and you'll note a double spiral on the ratchet wheel over the barrel. This is a sensational caliber that is decorated to match. A sense of occasion on both sides, 43 millimeters in white gold. This is one of 125 pieces made. So let's do a quick spotlight for both. Let me show you both of them close up. You guys let me know in the chat box which of these two you would prefer to put on your wrist. Do you go with the deadbeat or do you go with the deadbeat tourbillon? Blue versus see-through tourbillon, you guys tell me. Right here, High and Rising saying, Arnold could give Longa and Zona a run for its money. That's a fact, and what I can't show you, because I can't get that close, is that the finishing at the micro level is as impressive as the arm's length impression of those watches. Arnold and Son is beveling. Arnold and Son is creating polished jewel and screw countersinks, micro perlage, and unique finishes like that Cote de Soleil, Cote de Genève across the bridges. That's not just an iterated version of stripes, it's their own double-crested sunburst look. Very original. La Joux Pere, the manufacturer behind Arnold & Son, part of the Citizen Empire. They're making some of the finest watches in Switzerland. Get the word out or buy one of these watches and keep it a secret. Let's jump to F.P. Journe. Let's jump to F.P. Journe because this is an independent that has been, I would say, celebrated to about the greatest extent possible. No independent has received more recognition per watch than F.P. Journ. This is for a company that makes 600 to 900 watches a year, and the watch that I'm showing you is not one of the rock stars. It's not the Chronomet Bleu, it's not the CS, it's not the Tourbillon Remontoir, it's not the Chronomet Resonance. This is the Optimum, the Chronomet Optimum from the Souverain Collection, a quirky watch that represents F.P. Journ's ultimate mechanical chronometer. F.P. Journe has said this is the most accurate watch he can build with mechanical components. So let's start with what makes this one special. On the dial side, you have a power reserve that runs backward. At zero, it's fully wound. That's the hours since you last wound it. Up to 45 hours, it maintains constant amplitude about the balance, which means it keeps essentially perfect time as though it were fully wound from maximum power reserve down to about 25 hours remaining. It can run for 70 hours, but if you wind it at least every 45 hours, this watch can make a COSC chronometer look like an old church bell tower. Twin mainspring barrels in parallel, powering a Remontoir de Galatea that gives the watch a deadbeat second on its case back, even as it features a sweep second on its dial side. Two heartbeats. The Remontoir meters one second bursts of energy towards the escapement, so no matter how flush or how empty the barrels down to 45 hours elapsed, you're gonna get the same amplitude from the balance. There are twin double impulse titanium unlubricated escape wheels directly impulsing the balance. This is a double direct system, titanium wheels, no lubricants, inspired by the Breguet natural escapement. And to finish it all off, it's adjusted in six positions versus a chronometer's five, and it features an overcoil hairspring, something you rarely see on F.P. Journe watches. To top it all off, the movement is made of solid rose gold, and the watch, 40 millimeters in platinum, is part of the Black Label collection that can only be purchased if you already own a Journe watch and you buy at an authorized Espace or Journe factory boutique. This is my favorite FP Journe watch. It's a bit cerebral, but the mechanical virtuosity is what appeals to me. And I can tell you, Kieran Shakar, who literally wrote the book on F.P. Journe, has confided in me that this is also his favorite Journe. Well, I guess the secret's out there, but this is a timepiece for the ages and the best Jorn nobody talks about. Jumping straight in, I can see we got a lot of friends joining us tonight. Captain Zed, a longtime viewer, and the Watch Lounge saying Arnold and Son are a great bang for the buck brand compared to the big boys anyway. Another underrated brand like Bomb and Mercy, and by 
Oh, wait. Baum and Mercier with the BM-12 1975 movement, the five-day automatic chronometer, doing great things at a very accessible price point. Five-year service interval, chronometer certification, silicon escapement, five-day power reserve, 2500 bucks. Yes, please. Arnold and & Son and & Baum, different ends of the scale, but converging on excellence. Let's talk about the watch and its rival that I situated on the thumbnail for the episode. So these are two watches that are going to be compared in an upcoming Versus, and I was struck by how similar two watches from the Kings of Geneva really are. This is the 2015 to present, Rolex Yachtmaster 116655. Now you can see the ceramic insert on the bezel, which is otherwise rose gold, and you can see that this was the debut of the Rolex Oyster Flex bracelet. Yes, it's a bracelet. There is a nickel titanium alloy bracelet inside the rubber sheath, so it's actually a bracelet that looks like a strap. The watch is 40 millimeters in rose gold, automatic, a COSC chronometer, tank tough. You know what else is 40 millimeters? Strap slung and rose gold well from across town the patek philippe 5167r aquanaut brown bronze dial with a geosphere cut this one with all rose gold applique arabic numerals the two watches strikingly similar and yet so different between the two if i had to pick honestly even with the display case back of the patek even with the display case back over that movement and perhaps I can show you the movement to better effect from the other side so you can appreciate the balance somewhat more. But even with that display case back, I'm going with the Rolex because for me, the Rolex is simply moving the needle in terms of design, in terms of use of materials, and in terms of sheer durability. Rolex is giving me a movement with hacking seconds and a chronometer certificate. Patek is giving me a beautiful watch, but frankly, the innovation if not quite lagging with the addition of the silicon hairspring, isn't quite keeping a pace with Rolex. And the solidity of the two in the hand, I've got to give the edge to the product of the five-point coronet. The Rolex just feels a little bit more robust in the hand, and it's more wearable on the wrist. The Patek, though the same size, has a lot of flair and fight to its, its strap. It wants to combat you, although I do love the delicious chocolate brown composite that's used. The Rolex simply wears better on a small wrist. So Rolex, you got one up on your big brother, or perhaps I should say your little brother at a higher price point. Okay, friends, jumping in, I can see Captain Zed saying, my wife wears an FP Journe Elegant 48 almost every day. Need to get that back somehow. That is an awesome watch and the most underrated quartz watch made today. Possibly the most underrated FP Journe, rivaled only by that Chronomet Optimum. And I can see right here, Rich Buddy saying, Rolex 20,000, Patek 50,000. Well, on that basis, I guess we go for the Rolex, right? And I can see right here, Oh, Abdul. Abdul is a regular viewer and commenter on my Instagram and our shows here on YouTube. And he's saying Rolex also has a bezel, and that's the most important complication in my book. That's true. I would rather have a rotating bezel, even when it's a bi-directional bezel like on the Yachtmaster, because with this, once I have a bezel and I can line up that index with the minute hand, who needs a chronograph? For most things I'm going to time, a bezel is enough. So that's another element of functionality you don't get with the Patek. Good point, Abdul. I I like that. And I can also see right here the watch lounge saying a buddy of mine has that blue dial Patek. They are sick. Well, I'm not sure what blue dial you're talking about because I missed that earlier thread. Let's talk about two crazy blue dial Zeniths. Right here, this I cannot top. In my right hand, the Zenith DeFi El Primero 21 2018 blue dial edition. What you're really looking at is a metallic blue dial. Let's start up that chrono because you Hang on, this chrono has run out of power reserve. Let me show you how you wind this watch. You have to manually wind the chronograph power reserve. Now you wind it by turning the crown in a clockwise direction. This is the only way to energize the 50 minute power reserve of this watch. And then you start it and you have that crazy one one hundredth of a second foudrayant. You have one balance and escapement, 360,000 vibrations per hour. The other one, 36,000 vibrations per hour. That's the traditional El Primero. 53 joules, COSC certified chronometer, sensational aesthetic, but you can only run the chrono for 50 minutes before it goes dead. The watch will run for 50 hours. The 
funny thing, when you hack the seconds of the watch, the chrono keeps running. 100 meters water resistant, only 50 millimeters lug to lug. This grade five TIE flyer is a high flyer that will look fantastic and wear well on a small wrist. That said, that was the SIHH rival when Zenith put on a show on a boat alongside SIHH back in Geneva in January. This was the best debut that Zenith posed at Basel World. 41 millimeters in titanium. This is the DeFi Classic, powered by an Elite Caliber 670 with a low maintenance silicon escapement, a 50 hour power reserve, a bi directional quick set date, and a dial that proves we don't need all these open Ublo and Tag inspired dials. Zenith, this was your most interesting new watch of 2018, and I'm ending on a high note. I can't top this mighty might. 41 millimeters and a horological giant. This is the Zenith DeFi Classic, and that is my best watch of the evening. Guys, thank you so much for joining me. Great things in simple places. We find high horology and low, as well as a full price spec from all these watches, high and low horology, although let's call it high and luxury horology. Tim's Corner, Walnut Street, Philadelphia. Claudio's here to show you everything on the show this evening, all week long. Thank you to my friends, thank you to my crew. Guys, everyone who joined and made this possible, thank you so much, and finally, happy birthday to my mom. I'll be home soon, guys. Time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.